Um, so we progress to the very last session, um, which is also about Alzheimer's disease, but the, the caring aspect. Um, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Chris, Christopher Lien, who's senior consultant and director of community geriatrics in uh, Changi Hospital, Singapore, and also the governor of the Lien Foundation. So I think this is going to be very useful when we talk about Alzheimer's disease. What are we really talking about? What are the implications to people in the healthcare system? And how, uh, what are the ethical aspects? Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, Jean, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to, to such an interesting meeting. I've learned a lot, and uh, my, my, my thoughts have been um, immensely provoked, uh, and my heart as well. So I, I come on, in with two hats um, as a practicing geriatrician and as a governor of a, a family foundation that has uh, had some interest in funding um, aging initiatives and end of life initiatives. So I'll, I'll share some from my, um, a few thoughts from my professional perspective in Singapore and a few thoughts from a, a personal perspective um, in my own experience and some, uh, some thoughts from uh, um, the, some of the work that the foundation has uh, funded and undertaken. Um, just context. Um, this is where we're at in Singapore. We're we're uh, trans. We're, we're aging very rapidly. Um, this is us at the moment. Uh, our life expectancy is about 82 years old, and um, and this is uh, how we are um, progressing at the current moment. Um, in this context, 10% of our population are age 65 and above. Um, in of our 3.8 million residents and f f um, 5.4 million people who live in Singapore, uh, it will double in the next 10 years. Interestingly, um, in response to do uh, Dr. Kalaji's point, uh, there are about 200,000 200, foreign domestic workers in Singapore working as maids from the third world. Uh, we don't exactly know how many of them are looking after older people, but we know that a substantial number of them probably are. Um, the usual figures that was quoted yesterday <coughs> by, by Dr. Kwok, you know, that the older you are, the more admissions to hospital. And these are the number of admissions. The older you are, the more, uh, the more number of admissions you have per 12 months. Um, and we also know that towards the last six months of life, people uh, Patients with nursing homes um, come into hospitals, and a substantial number of patients in nursing homes have dementia. Um, but this is a project that was undertaken by Tantok Singh Hospital, uh, Project Care, which is end-of-life care in uh, nursing homes, doing advanced care planning conversations and putting a supportive team that also includes 24-hour support. And you can see that um, among Project Care patients, the, uh, there is a significant difference between those who uh, were not admitted versus the ones who are not on the program. So these are some of the things to, to think about in the context of Singapore. <coughs> we, we, we have lots of acute beds, 11,000 acute beds. We have 11,000 rehabilitation, convalescent, and long-term care beds, um, out of which 10,000 of these are nursing home beds. And the government has undertaken to build another 5,000 in the next uh, five years. And we also have day care centers, day rehabilitation centers, and a number of home care providers, of which uh, Wai Chong, you met him yesterday. He uh, runs one of the home care teams. Um, this very busy slide puts us into context in terms of the load of dementia. I just extracted some figures. Yeah, so that's Hong Kong, that's Singapore. We are 5.5 million population at the moment. We are, based on our projections, have 45,000 uh, pa patients with dementia, labeled dementia, and in 15 years, this will double. And in uh, another uh, 20 years from that, it will, uh, it will double even more. And uh, the comparati compara comparative figures for Hong Kong are, are just above. So it's, it's, a, it's a daunting task. Um, what, do, what does this mean to us um, as care providers um, clinical care providers, personal care providers, um, and as family members of patients with dementia. Um, 
a lot of a lot of the partnership work really is with the Alzheimer's Disease Association. Um, it was the branch in Singapore was founded in 1990. That's uh, 25 years ago. And, um, and it does a lot of the advocacy work. Um, and, and through this comes the, the whole, whole philosophy of care. So it's from a, 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 a small agency with um, um, a modest voice. It's become a major player in, uh, in the way care is delivered, uh, um, or the way advocacy and the way I, um, um, uh, understanding and awareness is created. And out of this, um, um, NGO, nonprofit organization, came came uh, um, a slightly more organized response from government, and this is our national mental health blueprint um, that uh, that lays lay, has laid down what we could do as a country from 2007 to 2012, and um, I've, I've laid out the contents page. Really, it's it's really from from um, young uh, adolescent health to dementia and outreach in the schools, in the workplace, in the community, and the whole initiative uh, and the penetration of, of dementia care. So we have a systematic thinking, um, but it doesn't quite translate to systematic services. Right, so there's a blueprint. There's a, 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 um, a, 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 at the heart of this is our community psychogeriatric teams. They can go out into nursing homes, they can go out to train um, non-profit uh, partners that run daycare centers that can also go into homes to crisis manage. Um, but this is where we're at. We have memory clinics and there's a four to six month lead time and the bulk of the patients that get referred to memory clinics are patients, patients with clear moderate dementia. Patients with mild dementia, the patients with uh, MCI still don't dominate at the moment um, and that's because awareness is not high and uh, and Health literacy among healthcare providers is also not high. So, so if we went out and made a huge campaign and say, look, early detection is important, then um, you will find that we might not be able to cope. So we want to, we are very hesitant to be too uh, too um, evangelical about telling people to come and see us. Right. So the memory clinics are full. The the early intervention programs are in place. They are variable in availability and quality. Um, and also, you know, if you have dementia and you attend an early intervention program for eight sessions and that's it, then that's really not going to be enough. And that's where we're at. You know, we have some programs, but not a lot. Uh, caregiver support is enrollment-based. So if somebody has a dementia, you will refer them to uh, um, the ADA, the Alzheimer's Disease Association, and it depends on them to call. It's not an automatic system unless you are at crisis point, then the case manager or social worker manages it for you. But we are not at that stage where every case can have a comprehensive conversation of a social worker. Right? So we, we, these are some of the limitations that we, we face. Um, and we have a whole bunch of programs you know, that, 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 that support patients with dementia. And, and this, this little um, cartoon maps the various people. Ideally, you know, the, these are the people that do the screening, and these are the supportive structures. Uh, but each of the, these boxes have a number of players of variable capabilities and variable capacity. So can you, you can imagine that you know, for, for the client or for the patient navigating this quandary, it's not so easy. And Moreover, because there are out-of-pocket payments, when patients are enrolled into services, uh, when patients are referred to services, 50% of them don't enroll. So that's another barrier, another limitation, and another challenge to, to, to think about how you provide clinical support for patients with dementia. Okay, that's context. Um, somebody asked me yesterday, uh, surely you don't have a, as much a problem with restraints in your long-term care institutions and hospitals. And I said, oh, I'll go look for some pictures and I'll show you. And this is a, uh, this is a nursing home. Yeah? So somebody who is very noisy and very restless. Um, so it is a problem. And this is a dementia-specific nursing home with a lot of capability, but this is a very restless patient. Um, perhaps the hospitals are better. This is a hospital. A lady who is demented and um, ten has the tendency of wanting to pull out a catheter. Um, and the culture continues. You know, this is a, this is a, 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 um, 
a, convol a long stay bed. Uh, we, we, we ran out of beds and we rented a ward in a private hospital and uh, run by the medical department and I was asked to go and see this as a referral and this was what I saw. And even uh, if you don't restrain patients, this patient is not restrained, but he walked into hospital. But because he was uh, uncomfortable, he had very bad spinal stenosis and dementia, he was kept in bed for three months. And he's now got contractures that cannot be straightened. So these are some of the, the, the extreme dilemmas that we face. Um, I'm going to try to play this. I'm not sure I can. You know. uh, whoops. No, I can't, yeah. But I was going to show you the uh, video clip that a relative sent me. It's a nice bungalow um, that a relative had rented out. And the tenant, an American tenant, had, uh, had called, had sent her a WhatsApp video clip of somebody groaning intensely. Uh, uh, uh. So I received the WhatsApp um, uh, um, attachment and he said, oh, the, the tenants are complaining that this goes on so 24 hours. Well, no, not 24 hours. It goes on for about six hours in the daytime and then for eight hours overnight. Um, and they want to know what to do about it. And since you're a geriatrician, I, we thought that, you know, we'd send this to you. And, um, and it's a very beautiful estate. There are two mates in the neighboring house that, where this old person is groaning. So what do you do about that? Do I press the bell and say, hey, I'm a relative of the owner of the house who's rented this house out and there's a complaint that somebody's groaning and maybe as a geriatrician I can help you make your relative not groan so much? Or do I just go, uh, well, let's see what happens. Or, oh, yeah, that is very disturbing, isn't it? It went on for about six months and uh, we, we heard, last heard that the groaning has stopped because the old person has passed away. So th th these are some of the questions that we, we want to talk about. This is a home care patient that we, we saw. We, we went, after numerous attendances to, to A&E uh, for hyperglycemia, for falls, for urinary tract infection, we finally sent in the home team to our house. Um, when we first saw her, she was in an office chair, in one of those roller chairs. She was rolling herself around the house, and uh, it was extremely precarious. The medicines were everywhere. Uh, HbA1c was uh, 13%. And she was on insulin, and she was, uh, and, and we, when we went in, we realized the medicines was in a complete mess. And so we started to try to systematically uh, tidy things up. And she, of course, immediately that was confronted with scolding, don't touch my things, I know where they are, I know what these things are, you mess it up for me, I won't know where they are. So that, that fight continued, and when we saw her on an office chair, she said, we'll give you a walking frame. She says, no, it's troublesome, and it's not going to work. We bought her a new one, and uh, guess what? She tried to go to the toilet, and the walking frame can't get in. Right, so these are some of the barriers, and we we and this went on, you know, to just trying to manage her medicines, trying her dementia. There was a daughter every time she was in hospital. Somebody spoke to the daughter, but when the team finally went to the house, we realized that the daughter had lots of problems of her own. She was holding on to two jobs. She was married to two different women. Um, to, she was married to uh, she had two two children from two different men, but not with not from the man that she was living with in the house. Right, so these were her problems. She said, "I can't handle my mother." And, uh, and, uh, and we're still, two years down the line, we're still trying to address this problem. Um, this is another patient we saw in the home care place. This, we, we, we tried to suggest a hospital bed on discharge. And the doctor said, no, I have a relative who's going to give one to us. And this is uh, uh, the, the long trolley that you see in the corridor. And we went into the house, and this gentleman was in the long trolley. Um, and uh, we brought in a pressure mattress, but the pressure mattress had to lie on the trolley, so this is, this is what, what he was on. But eventually, we, we got him up and uh, tried to rehabilitate him. He also has Parkinson's disease. But the whole journey of just trying to get him rehabilitated was extremely difficult. The daughter who had taken him into the house was the venue provider, but not the payer. And the carer was a maid who was not entirely empowered. Um, and when we are not there, he's restrained so he can't pull out his NG tube. So these are, these are again, some of the common themes that we, we had to face. Um, I will probably, I've got quite a lot of other ideas, but I think in the interest of time, I'll just stop there. And, uh, and we could pick this up again later on. Right. Thank you very much. We can have discussions afterwards.
So um, our next speaker is um, Professor Helen Chu, Professor of Psychiatry in CUHK. Uh, she's also the president of the Hong Kong Psychogeriatric Association. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my topic today is caring for people with dementia in Hong Kong, and I will bring out some ethical perspectives as well. Uh, as I'm only given uh, 10 to 15 minutes, so I will try to be brief to address several issues in this brief presentation. How big is the problem of dementia in Hong Kong? Where are not, uh, we now in dementia care? What are the domains in dementia care? Uh, what are the strengths and barriers of dementia care in Hong Kong? And then I would bring up some ethical aspects uh, that are more relevant from a psychogeriatrician's perspective. And then lastly, what is the way forward? So how big is the problem? Around 30 years ago, when I started my career as a young doctor, I attended uh, the farewell dinner of an expatriate uh, physician. Uh, he gave a speech during the dinner, and he said that he found that there's one thing that is uh, very strange in Hong Kong during his 20 years of uh, medical practice. He has never seen a patient with dementia. So maybe at that time, dementia is really very uncommon, or the diagnosis of dementia is, is seldom made uh, at that time. But in the last two decades, the problem of dementia is getting more and more visible and prominent. Uh, research in our department over the last two decades show that the prevalence of dementia is increasing and the overall prevalence is similar to the prevalence in most of the developed countries in the world. I think uh, you are uh, familiar with the figures quoted by the Alzheimer's Disease International. Dementia is now a major global public health challenge with 4.7% of people aged 60 or above being affected. And the numbers are increasing exponentially. And recently the ADI has adjusted the number of people affected by dementia. So in 2050, it would be 135 million. So a great number of people will be affected. And most of the people with dementia live in the Asia Pacific region. So we see that this uh, dementia is really a very big health challenge. Where are we now in dementia care? Around 15 years ago, Hong Kong is a leader of dementia care in Asia. I remember that at that time, uh, many people from other countries in Asia come to visit our uh, innovative projects and learn from our model. But how about now? I'm sorry to say that at present, our services are still quite piecemeal. Although they are innovative projects, uh, but there is, uh, the services development is still quite fragmented. So, and there are many gaps of services. In dementia care, we have to look at several domains because dementia is actually a very complex disease. There is cognitive deterioration, physical comorbidity, functional decline, behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, which I will touch on in the next slide, care, stress, and social and financial issues. So from this line, I hope you can get the idea that uh, patients with dementia have very complex and multifaceted needs. And there are actually two groups of clients that we have to treat, both the patient and the carer. Now, behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia or BPSD occurs in over 90% of patients with dementia. Examples are hallucinations, delusions, mood problems, agitation, and so on. And it's associated with carer stress, decreased uh, quality of life, premature institutionalization, and increased cost of care. Most guidelines would recommend that management of BPSD uh, is by psychosocial interventions as a first-line treatment. And drugs is only considered later on if uh, this fail, because drugs have a lot of side effects. So in the management of BPSD, a multidisciplinary approach is important. What are the strengths in Hong Kong? Uh, I would say that the high standard of medical and professional staff, strong and enthusiastic NGOs, 
and the highly skilled and innovative multidisciplinary staff. I think Hong Kong should be proud of all these, uh, which are strengths in dementia care. And I also include domestic helpers as our strengths, because without them, many of our elderly with dementia would be admitted into residential services. What are the barriers to dementia care? I would say that the most important uh, element or barrier is that there's no comprehensive policy on dementia care, so that there is inadequate coordination among sectors. Over the years, there has been a lot of debate of whether dementia care is a medical problem or a social problem. How much services should be delivered by the social sector and how much by the health services? It's like uh, playing ping pong. I give the ball to you and you give the ball back to me. So this happened uh, for a lo uh, long time. Low public awareness, inadequate community services, space and manpower uh, constraints in both residential services and hospitals, and this may increase BPSD, and inadequate training of uh, general practitioners. For the special, specialist care, uh, there are also a lot of uh, barriers. There's a long waiting time for new referrals, although the waiting time differ across clusters. But take an example of our cluster in the uh, New Territories East. The usual waiting time for a uh, new referral of dementia without complication is about two years before you would be seen in our specialist operation clinic. And uh, there's a long waiting time for doing a CT brain. Uh, it, it takes about nine months. So that it means that there will be a long delay from the time of referral to the time the patient uh, will be treated with drugs or other services. So it, on average, two to three years. There is a low priority on dementia care by the government, uh, the hospital authority, and the cluster. Because most patients with dementia, they, they do not pose any serious violence or risk uh, to others. And usually, priority is given by the government or hospital authority if there's any serious risk. So all along, dementia care is of low priority. The limited financial and manpower resources. Now, from a psychotherapist's point of view, uh, there are several ethical issues I would like to raise. Uh, just now, I've mentioned about the long delay in providing dementia diagnosis and treatment and various services. Uh, just because these patients are less violent than other pa uh, patients with other diagnoses or younger patients or they pose less risk to themselves, uh, does it justify this sort of long delay in services? I've shown a slide earlier on that dementia patients' needs are actually very complex and multifaceted. So is it acceptable or ethical for this sort of delay in services? Secondly, uh, just now uh, the previous speaker has mentioned about the problem of physical restraint. In Hong Kong, apart from the fact that the patient is restless, our environments may actually be inducive or they aggravate the behavioral problems of the elderly. For example, in many residential settings in private nursing homes, they have very small space. All the elderly live in a big dormitory and they don't live in single rooms. So if uh, one person screams, it would be very disturbing for the whole home. And if the elderly would like to take a walk around, they may be labeled as, as being disturbing that they are having BPSD. So physical restraint may be applied uh, to protect the patients. But again, uh, we know that physical restraint has a lot of complications. So the widespread use of physical restraint is uh, another ethical uh, issue. And then for the clinician, in the management of BPSD, uh, there is now a black box warning by the FDA on the use of antipsychotics, because antipsychotics is associated with an increased risk of stroke and mortality. But because of the lack of good environment and manpower, and as a clinician, we are only allowed around uh, seven or eight minutes to see a, pa a dementia patient. So frequently we are faced with this sort of ethical dilemma, whether uh, we should prescribe uh, the psychotropic drugs with side effects to the patients. 
in this slide, I just want to impress you that because of the multifaceted and complex needs of people with dementia, when we formulate a dementia strategy or a dementia care uh, policy, we have to address the various aspects of domains uh, and the needs of the elderly and the carers. So I won't go into the details of the framework. Lastly, the way forward. Although the government has set up an expert group on dementia, and I'm also a member of the expert group, uh, this group is supposed to look into the policy aspect on dementia care, but I'm still very worried that at the end of the day, uh, only some piecemeal enhancement of services uh, will be prepared, and there's still no comprehensive policy on dementia care, and we're left with a similar situation as now. So I think to address the barriers and the gaps of services uh, in dementia care in Hong Kong, we need a strong political will from the government, as well as the active participation of all the stakeholders involved. Uh, with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Helen, for uh, clearly putting forward the current situation. Um, the next speaker is um, Dr. James Luke, who is consultant geriatrician in the Hong Kong West Cluster. He's currently the president of the Hong Kong Geriatric Society. So I think he's going to tell us more of the same depressive picture. Um, good afternoon. Um, I tried to talk something about uh, the ethics in Alzheimer's disease from a clinician's and geriatric's point of view. Ethical issues of dementia is uh, multiple. We can have uh, advanced care planning issues, advanced directive issues, end of life issues, place of death issues, whether put in the tube feeding or not issues, even using restraints as Christopher has shown some Singapore features and guardianship order issues and even elder abuse issues. We can talk about this in the panel discussions. But what I want to do in this 10 minutes time is to try to concentrate on the ethical issues of using advanced directive in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And one of our studies show that actually patients with advanced Alzheimer's disease have high mortality. In the study in residential care homes, we found that actually 34% died within one year. It is a cohort study. So we are, they are really facing a lot of end of life issues. I remember the ethics is autonomy. It was very important. So using ACP or advanced directives is one of the um, autonomy based standard to protect patients' right of autonomy. I'm sure most of you will know some of the benefits of the advanced directive in Alzheimer's disease. It can allow competent patients before they become demented to control their own post-competence medical interventions so as to fulfill their values and goals. And also it also helps to relieve the burden of the relatives or family members to make decisions at the end of life issues and resolve disputes about family. So hopefully with advanced directive, the old gentleman can have a peace of mind. In Hong Kong, we do not have a law governing advanced directive. It's put under the common law. It is believed that uh, a more legally binding advanced directive can guide doctors and families to make decisions in the best interest of the patients in most situations. Why in many places like UK, Australia, in Singapore, they have their own law governing advanced directive. In hospital authority in Hong Kong, um, the advanced directive started in 2010 and now we have the 2014 versions. And this can be implemented when the patient becomes terminally ill or persistent vegetative state with or without irreversible coma or other irreversible end stage light living conditions. There are also a short form too. This is uh, one of the forms that can download from the hospital authority um, uh, website. Uh, in situation one is terminally ill conditions, and they also have a lot of uh, definitions of what is life sustaining treatments, including artificial nutrition and hydration. This is situation two when you have persistent vegetative state or irreversible coma. The last situation is uh, other end stage irreversible life limiting conditions. 
be it uh, anesthetic renal failure, new motor neuron disease, heart disease, lung disease, etc. The HA position is, is quite clear cut. A valid and applicable AED must be respected, and a healthcare professional who know there is a valid AED, if refused to follow, may be liable to legal action. So far, everything seems to be quite black and white and quite clear cut. But actually, there, if you think clearly, there are quite a lot of ethical issues involving the use of advanced directive in Hong Kong in the context of Alzheimer's disease. I try to summarize into 10, but actually you can think deeply there are even more. Patient may have difficulty to make a advanced directive before the actual scenario happens. It requires a lot of imagination, actually. And also, what is the best time to make the advanced directive? You look at this uh, um, cancer disease trajectory. Is it the best time to do it uh, when you are still healthy? or when you have a cancer diagnosis, or when you reach the end of life stage, and when you are still competent. There are a lot of debate, which is the best time. Obviously, you can revoke when you make it 20 years ago, but, but uh, you may forget you have made a advanced directive actually. Ethical issues too is, advanced directive actually assumes the medical condition, prognosis treatment, et cetera, and goals and values, et cetera. At the time you make this, advanced directive is the same when it is implemented. But I mentioned it may be true, it may not be true because the span of time issues. It may be 20 years later, the things may change. As Professor Hanju said, we have only about eight minutes to see a dementia patients and many medical patients. So, but explaining advanced directives are time consuming. And also they are inadequate knowledge and training of doctors, as well as the public and families. This one study locally showing that the medical students, 90% think that their knowledge about advanced therapies are inadequate, and nearly 90% think that they're unprepared to discuss these sort of issues with patients. And nearly half of them felt that there was inadequate education on these issues. The first ethical issue is, um, the clinical team may be difficult to judge the validity of the advanced directive. Imagine the A&E suddenly the, some people bring you a copy of the advanced directive, or an advanced, advanced directive made in USA or in Australia. Are they valid in Hong Kong? HA has a clear guideline. If you are questioned about the validity, you still need to continue life sustaining treatment. But such treatment may be withdrawn later if the validity is confirmed. To clinicians, it may not be easy because after you're intubated and ventilating the patients, it's very difficult to convince the relatives that you need to extubate the patient and stop the ventilator and, and remove the plug. So they cause a lot of emotional, if not legally, issues. Also, the confirmed validity may be useful to discuss with witnesses, family members, and healthcare team looking after the patients before. And I also suggest assistance from the legal and ethical team as well as the hospital management. The fifth ethical issue is the clinical team may not be, may be difficult to accept the advanced directive, which appears not in the best interest of the patient. We have a chance to talk to the patients again because he is uh, mentally incompetent at that time. For instance, an advanced directive request to not to ventilations but physicians think that the ventilator is the only temporary treatment and is doing good and reducing suffering to the patients. A one started may demand withdrawal of artificial nutrition or hydration, which is controversial to some people, especially Chinese, you may think that it may be a sort of euthanasia. It may limit care also, leading to under treatment. How about without legal legislation in Hong Kong, there might be some legal uncertainties. When family members challenge the validity of the advanced directive, or even the patient himself or herself challenge his own advanced directive, but of course at that time, he or she has become a mentally incapacitated person. 
it's a bit unlucky that uh, during the uh, discussions of uh, end of life issues and advanced care planning, advanced directive, the fire services and ambulance are not in the in the um, in the team. I would say so. If you even you have a advanced directive or a DNA CPR order, the ambulance may still resuscitate you until you reach the A and E. In the A and E also there may be a difficult task to identify the advanced directive and make sure the patient is in a terminal conditions to implement the directive. We can further discuss on this point. Last but not the least is the cultural difference. Um, I would say that advanced directive is more or less a Western concept. But a lot of studies in Asian and Chinese culture show that our uh, Chinese rely a lot of collective family decisions. So do you, we, is uh, helping enduring power of enemy on healthcare is even better than advanced directive? So may I end by saying that we still have a long way to go for advanced directive in Hong Kong. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Look. Um, so, if I want just a brief s summary, um, Dr. Zian kind of painted the practical day-to-day -day, uh, issues that we face. Um, we look after de de demented people with very little resource, and what, what, whatever we do end up seem to be contravening basic ethical principles by applying restraints and etc. And also, there's this tendency to shift the responsibility of care to the family, uh, perhaps supporting the idea of, of uh, filial piety and all that, um, rather than that it's a, a state's responsibility, um, which leads to a lot of undesirable pra practices. Um, Professor Chu raised an issue that uh, really um, remind us what the first session was all about, that we're populating uh, your health systems, uh, your policies, uh, matching the needs of the population. And the, the change has been so rapid that um, the, the system has not caught up. I'm not sure whether the system and the policymakers are aware of all these issues, there being always a gap between what the front line sees and what the policymakers understand. Um, and certainly she pointed out that current system, I think both in Singapore and, and Hong Kong, and I, I suspect in many other countries, are really not fit for looking after these people in, in a, an ethical way. And finally, the whole issue of advanced care plan, um, uh, power of attorney, I mean, uh, a lot of, when, when, who can make the power of attorney? Uh, can people with mild dementia make it or severe? I mean, we can debate all these issues. So um, I would like to invite comments from the audience, yes. Yes, yeah, so I'm really addressing them to um, Dr. Luke um, because of actually I've I've also had been looking at the uh, advanced directives issue um, actually from when I received notification that there was a consultation exercise in the middle of in the in early July 2004. Now that's already 11 years ago. Looking at that, um, there's one epic fail of the Hong Kong Law Reform Commission. You read the, you read the um, initial document and it goes on about dementia and the final recommendations drops dementia altogether. Um, it's lucky that in both uh, in the 2014 um, edition of the HA guidelines on advanced directors, we've actually added the, the, the things that are, you know, um, originally the three categories are terminal disease, uh, irreversible coma, persistent vegetative state. And of course that doesn't, sit comfortably with the elderly with dementia. The other problem is about both changing minds and changing, uh, are we the same person when we make the direct, uh, advanced directives as when the advanced directive is valid? Um, in America, um, in the last chapter of Ronald Dawkins' book, and I forgot the uh, name of the book, I, I think it's Life's Dominion. It's about life, uh, life beyond reason and about Margot. From Margot's logo, which was from a 1991 um, piece of my mind by Andrew Firkin, then, uh, then a medical student, about if there was a happily demented old lady, she has an advanced directive um, 
to be not treated for a simple infection. Yet, you can give the simple infection, it's, it's actually, I think, your point nine, you know, the ventilator, you know, and it can actually improve care, uh, improve life, um, quality, quality of life at that time. Are we the same person? And if you actually read that chapter and subsequent, um, you know, uh, discussion about that, especially if you read things like uh, Derek Parfit, Persons and Reason, about a, a su succession of selves and identities, you know, you, you begin to actually challenge um, the philosophical basis of advanced refusals, or, or even any, or, uh, quite a lot of these things. And I think uh, I'm just throwing the Margot's logo thing uh, into the discussion because it, that was mainstream bioethics, and it went up to um, the President's Bioethics Committee. And Ronald Dawkins ar argued one point, Re Rebecca Dresser, at the um, um, then, I think the chairman, uh, went on to the opposite conclusion. But anyway, I think I, I hope to extend the, um, the discussion. Dr. Luke, would like to comment? Thanks for your pointing out that uh, in the 201 versions, the dementia is not in the context. But uh, now we have the third clause is uh, having an organ universal illnesses plus some cognitive impairment. Advanced cognitive impairment, then you can activate advanced directive. Yes, uh, your point of uh, whether we are the same person now or 20 years later is always debatable, right? So you don't know whether the thing you are thinking is the same, right? At that time, you may go into Mars to live already, so everything are, are different. You forgot to revoke your advanced directive for some reason, then your things 20 years ago will become activated in the so in 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 space yeah, age, right? right. I, I just want, we, we may discuss this, that you can have a happily demented person and you can ask the happily demented person whether they want to change their advanced directive. And it, so, so this is a question of when do you l lose the mental capacity to make these things? I mean, there's a, a view that if you're mildly demented, you can, you can still have this conversation. But if you're mute and you're dying, uh, you know, that, that's a different picture. So dementia covers a really very broad um, uh, a range of presentation. Um, are there, yeah. Um, yes. Again, great presentations. For Dr. Luke, you mentioned at the end that advanced directives is a Western concept and that a Chinese approach might be more collective decision making. I wonder if there have been studies looking at how often the collective decision of the family may be at odds with what the patient may want. Uh, there are studies in the U.S. that spouses often actually don't really know what they each want in terms of advanced directives. Um, I couldn't remember the name, but I can correspond to two, at least uh, two studies that uh, they found that the, a lot of time when you ask about the, the older people or the Chinese people, if there's important decisions, who will you turn to, yourself or your relatives? Most of them would say, that, oh, I'll let the son or the daughter to make the decisions for me. Obviously, these are peer studies. Generation may change, okay? If I get old, I want to get, I won't, I won't give the decision to my daughter, so I don't believe in them anyway. <laughs> but I may give a decision to my wife uh, or take the responsibility to myself. So this depends on which generation the Chinese and which countries the Chinese. I mean, Singapore Chinese, Taiwan Chinese, and mainland Chinese are also different. I don't think that Chinese should be one good look at just yeah. one group. But perhaps uh, Dr. Liang could comment. Singapore, you have Chinese, Malays, and Indians. Do you see a, a huge difference? There, I, there are two fun two issues there. The first is the Advanced Medical Directive Act. This, case, this was passed in Singapore in 1996, but not uh, before an intense debate in Parliament. Um, in fact, the, the debates were so rigorous uh, that, 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 every, that everything was questioned, the, 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 the purpose, how it could be abused, and the safeguards that need to be put in, in, in place so that it will not be abused. So much so that the, the spirit of the Advanced Medical Directive was tweaked to only be actionable in the event of defined terminal illness. 
So you somebody and and the certification of terminal illness becomes the, the it becomes the bone of contention. So you cannot ask a patient whether they have a, a medical advanced medical directive in if when they come to hospital because that could potentially uh, uh, co conflict in your judgment. And only if two independent doctors certify that the pers person is at imminent death can you then call up a registry to extract the medical directive and and the registry is not 24 7 and it's only five days a week so so that itself limited the utility of it so much so that um you really only want to check when it's obvious and the relatives tell you that there is one so so i think less uh, not more than a few thousand people have made uh, the AMD in the last 20 years. So, and that has really been the impetus of us moving away from legislating yes or no to having a conversation. So in the last five years, we have um, been working very closely with the Gunders and Lutheran um, uh, people in, in Wisconsin to, to introduce the, the, the thinking of respecting choices into advanced care planning conversations. And really, the whole conversation starting from uh, who am I, what does living well mean, and in, when I am, have my mental capacity with, my, with me, who would be my preferred choice of decision making in the event of uh, or, or something goes wrong. So this is really uh, just changing the whole conversation from having an, a, making an ACP when you have a life-limiting disease to making an ACP when, before you have one. And then that, uh, that so, so we are in the process of prototyping a system where we now have ACP conversations with, uh, with, 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 patient, um, with, with, with patients, and we can upload the conversation onto a national electronic uh, medical record. The, the data I showed was, uh, was this small project in the nursing home called Project Care was done with patients, not all with decision-making capacity. So in, by strict definition, if you do an ACP with the relatives, it's not really an ACP. Right? So some of them, the conversation was had with the family members. But for the bulk of, uh, for a substantial number of it, the, 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 the conversation was actually with the patient and, and in, done in the nursing home so that the whole context of care could be put in place in, in terms of what the, the nurses could deliver and what they were fearful of delivering. And, and, and you, you saw the results. It's, it's, it's something that we want to continue to work on and, and to maybe extend it to, uh, to um, uh, non-nursing home patients as well. Do you see any difference between the different ethnic groups in Singapore, Chinese and Indians and Malays, um, in, in terms of the role of the family and, uh, you know? They, 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 I don't have data on that, although the Lane Foundation did do some work with, yeah. uh, with uh, a market research agency called Black Box, and they looked at the attitudes of people in terms of the willingness to talk about de um, death and dying and all these awkward issues, and Chinese people were more reluctant to talk about uh, death. But when there's something urgent happening, when there's a crisis, then everybody's willing to, to a lot more willing to talk about uh, um, um, contentious issues like these. Yeah. Um, uh, Peter excuse me. and then excuse me. Alex. Excuse me. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, because yeah. I, I, I thought I must say something. Yeah. Right. <laughs> to be ethical. Yeah. Uh, because uh, as an immediate past president of the Hong Kong Association of Rehabilitation Medicine, I think the word rehabilitation has been missed out totally in the caring for patients with Alzheimer's disease in Hong Kong. I mean, from the whole, whole forum, we heard that the dementia, you know, the disease trajectory may take up to 10 to 20 years for development. And then we are actually facing uh, the, you know, uh, the gloomy pictures you know, in the acute hospitals and also a lot of medical wards nowadays. But although that gloomy picture is the end of the spectrum of the disease, but I can quote two examples that uh, we can help our dementia patients a lot from the rehabilitation perspective. Uh, and what Professor Helen Chiu mentioned in, in one of her slides, functional, functional uh, adaptability. I, I have one patient uh, uh, transferred from McGill Hospital who did not eat for seven days and put on, uh, put on IV fluid for seven days. She was 60 years old. And then my first minute with the, the care with her is I asked her, How, what's your name? She can tell. The second question, what's, what, what is your age? She said 38. My third question is, what do you like most doing when you are 38? 
she's a painter. And then her husband is a, a, you know, an artist. Our treatment is allow her to just paint. And then in three days, she eats again and discharged like a normal human being and discharged. That is one example. Another example is my most respected neighbor who, who witnessed my upbringing, now 90 years old, dementia. When she played mahjong, she is 30 years old. <laughs> and then, of course, we, we all understood dementia patients, they, when they get older, they have a lot of disability, become chair bang, whatever, carer's dress, her 75-year-old nurse carer nearly run into breakdown. But as you mentioned, one of the key community resources is daycare center. And then she is a very good functional uh, family now. Yeah, I mean, so, I, I agree. I mean, that is part of dementia care, and it doesn't particularly raise any ethical issues. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're kind of focusing on, on these yeah. extremes. I mean, I, I'm very glad that, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are providing th those sort of programs. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think so the, Helen, the, yeah. what I'd like to bring out is our, our uh, you know, the gap in the whole healthcare system is very big in, in dementia care. And then, obviously, who, who is going to pay or who are going to pay for that 20 years of uh, so-called uh, pre-functional decline care so to ensure, you know, the, we always talk about compression of the mobility and mortality curve. And then our goal is, of course, uh, you know, ha happy aging and, help, uh, you know, healthy aging, happy death. And then to achieve that, we, we must plan ahead, but not at this end of spectrum. Just talking about end of life. Thank you. I think you are very right. Uh, from what you say, we can see that uh, you, you and your association is probably an important stakeholder uh, to be involved in the planning uh, of the policy that I mentioned just now. So I've emphasized uh, for many years uh, that there must be a comprehensive policy from uh, very early on, from the preventive aspects to the later uh, development of services and various stakeholders, uh, not just the uh, very famous people or certain specialists should be involved, but various stakeholders in the community should be involved in the planning. Yeah, so we have time for two more. One from uh, Peter Wong and then maybe uh, then followed by Dr. Kalash. Uh, quite honestly, I'm absolutely appalled by what I've been hearing on behalf of the, the demented people who cannot speak for themselves. 20 years ago, uh, I was lucky enough to be in LegCo to lead the charge to have retirement savings. But I see that the, you know, the government has really do, done really nothing for this very uh, sad part of our population. And I will certainly uh, take this away. I will certainly try to do something about it, getting the government to recognize that this is a problem and it's got to be dealt with quickly and taking the whole of the population of Hong Kong with it. Not, it cannot just be dealt with by the people who are giving service, getting money out of this. It's got to be dealt with by everybody. No, I'm age 70. So sooner or later, I will be affected by this. So I do care, and I hope that other people who care will join me and do something about it. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Dr. Kalashi. Thank you. Uh, I do care too, because what may affect you uh, slightly before uh, may affect me later and then affect everybody. We are all in the same boat. And, and perhaps, and I was hesitating, I didn't know if I wanted or not to make an intervention at the end of this panel. The panel was excellent, but it shows only a fraction of what it is actually a 10, 12, 15 year journey. And if we only focus on this specialized care that you provide and you are trying to provide very well, I have no doubt about that, um, we miss that continuum of care, which is not only suffering, which is not only pain, which is not only all the dimensions that we know, the challenges of providing care to Alzheimer. I'm not speaking as a professional here. 
I'm speaking here as the son and my mother has Alzheimer. If I would have given a presentation or make an intervention about care of Alzheimer 10 years ago, it would be very different from the intervention or presentation that I would make today because I have also learned the joys of providing care. And what I was saying yesterday, the gender dimension, that that care is mostly provided by women, we men, we have to learn to share not only the pain and the suffering, and it can be exhausting, but also the joy of providing care. Because every single time that my mother smiles to me, that my mother sings with me, that my mother plays the piano with me, that is, I cannot even describe the joy that it brings uh, to me as her son, as a human being. We have to learn that compassion. And yesterday I was saying that compassion was not a word I heard in my medical training. It is still absent of a medical school. So with all the respect for the work that we are doing, we have to go away from that radar syndrome that professionals have. We see the patient 10 minutes, if it is at the primary health care level, 24 hours within a journey that takes many months, or perhaps a month in a long-term institution of a journey that has taken 10, 12 years. And it's only what we are describing, that radar, because it is right in front of you, which is the screen, that radar syndrome. The rest of the care is out of your perspective, your experience, is at home, at the community. And this is why the work that NGOs do is so important. And what we missed in this session was the voice of older persons the voice of NGOs, the civil society, the voice of the carers, not only professional carers, the specialized, specialized care, but the care that is done day to day in the community. And I repeat, it's not made of only of pain and suffering. There is also a lot of joy. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris. Yes. Um, I at the point that I stopped, I was going to show two slides, as a, as a, um, if I may respond to that, you know. And one was a picture of my grandmother, who died of old age at the age of 98, with progressive forgetfulness. She never had a diagnosis, you know. And the second was a picture of my mom, uh, who's age 78 this year, uh, with all her grandchildren. And she's just um, received a label of dementia, my dementia, she's still driving my kids to school, she's still planning parties, she still travels. Um, and, and as I come to terms with the phenotype of what she's presenting, of course in my mind, you know, with my medical training, I'm thinking of the genotype and thinking of whether I should subject myself to APOE testing and just so that I can know what's in store for myself. And, but that apart, it, 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 a lot of the advice that I give to patients suddenly comes hitting back at me, um, try to, engage your mother more. It's easier said than done. Try to bring life to her day. But you know, her attention span is not as long as it was before, so how do I extend it? Try to involve your father. But my father's 84, and he's, he says, you know, look, I, I've lost my sight in one eye. I can't look after your mother. I need her to look after me. You know, try to involve the caregiver, but the last caregiver just got sacked because she made my mother angry, and you know, and that was before the diagnosis was made. You know, so, so, so suddenly, the advice that I give at the consultation room becomes very real and, and, and also very um, somewhat painful, but at the same time very challenging. Because the question is, then how do you turn this to a journey of, of meaning rather than a journey of pain and loss and, and distress? Because surely this is part of the natural resource that we are asked to tap into to make um, aging and dementia part of our being and part of our meaning making. Yes, uh, I think on that positive note, where we, we think that uh, there's a long trajectory before they come to all the depressing slides that we've seen, that it, it is possible to have fun, uh, but the trick is to get inside their mind and communicate with them. And I think that we, we need a lot of training, a lot of skill to be able to do that, and that's very important. 
Um, so on, on that note, uh, because of time, I'd like to thank all the panel speakers and all the audience for, for joining in this discussion. Thank you.